The second crisis that we're going to deal with today hops to another hemisphere. Oh my gosh. He he wants to go. Um, so we we talked last week about how the Cold War spread from Europe to Asia. Now the Cold War is going to hop across the Atlantic to the Americas. This is a Fidel Castro. And we know Fidel Castro is going to become the leader of Cuba. Currently his brother is ruling in Cuba. <laughs> this is going to be the next and probably most serious crisis in the, uh, the Cold War uh, story. Let's rewind a little bit to some history of Cuba, to some backstory of Cuba. You don't need to write all this. Cuba used to be a Spanish colony. And in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the United States fought a war with Spain. Now, we fought a war with Spain under the auspices of ending Spanish colonialism in the Americas and liberating peoples that were dominated by a Spanish colony, the colonial system. And so we like, worked with Cuban people and said, support us in this fight, and then you will have your independence. And we won the Spanish-American War. And this is really the United States becoming a major empire power, a major imperial power. Because we're not only going to take win the Spanish-American War, but we are going to take Puerto Rico as an American territory. We're going to take over the Philippines. We're going to take over Guam, an island of the Pacific. We're going to take um, a chunk of Cuba here. But we couldn't take over all of Cuba because we kind of started this war in Cuba with the belief that we would kind of help the Cubans become independent. So after the Spanish-American War, the United States and the Cuban government are going to sign an agreement known as the Platt Agreement, P-L-A-T-T. -T. This is in 1902. And the Platt Agreement said two things, essentially, two important things for us. One, that the United States would get permanent lease of a naval base at Guantanamo Bay. And you guys can see that on the southern portion of Cuba there. And we obviously still have Guantanamo Bay, right? That's where we send our, you know, suspected terrorist bad guys, because nobody wants suspected terrorist bad guys in, like, Hudson Bay. Uh, that's in Canada. I don't know where we put them at. Uh, no one wants them in our own backyard, right? You guys ever hear the acronym? NIMBY? Yeah. <laughs> NIMBY means not in my backyard. Like, everybody wants more prisons, but no one wants prisons by them. Um, everybody wants more nuclear power plants in the country. Well, not everybody, but nobody wants nuclear power plants built by them. Um, everybody wants more, like, green energy and more, more big windmills, but there's a lot of rich people in Massachusetts that don't want to look at windmills as they look out into their beautiful ocean vistas, right? Uh, so NIMBY is not in my backyard. We, we would rather have these guys sent to Guantanamo Bay than anywhere else. Barack Obama, you remember, ran on a campaign pledge to close down Guantanamo Bay back in 2008. Yeah, that hasn't gone anywhere, right? And it's not going to go anywhere. So Guantanamo Bay, we're going to get. But the more important part of the Platt Agreement is this. And please listen to the language actually used. The United States, we said, the United States would intervene for the preservation of Cuban independence. Yay! And the maintenance of a government adequate for the protection of life, property, and individual liberty. Cuba, you're going to be independent. But don't worry. If anyone ever threatens that independence, the United States will intervene. And if ever there's a government that would threaten your property or your liberty, we will intervene. How independent does Cuba really sound? Sounds like they're pretty independent as long as we are cool with the government that they're going to have, right? Well, things will come to a dramatic change in the 1950s. But before we get there, in the intervening decades, the United States loved Cuba. And the Cuban government loved the United States. Because American businesses would go to Cuba and then open up shop. And we went to Cuba and we built railroads. And we started sugar plantations and took over sugar plantations and made them larger and more fruitful. Or sugarful. More sweet. Sweeter. Cool. Yeah. Um, we set up power grids. And so many of the major industries in Cuba were actually owned and run by American companies. And there are certainly going to be some Cubans that will benefit tremendously from this, especially those in power. 
But many humans won't see those, uh, those benefits. And by the 1950s, there begins to be some growing frustration amongst the poor in Cuba that they're kind of getting a bum deal here. They can see how the rich and famous are playing in Havana. And Havana used to be a place that the, the wealthy Americans would go to uh, for their like, you know, weekend destinations and vacations and whatnot. But then the majority of Cubans really weren't doing all that well. In the 1950s, there will be a popular revolution led by Fidel Castro and his right-hand man that you would see on some t-shirts to this day, a guy named Che Guevara. These guys would lead a revolution, a popular revolution in Cuba to overthrow this government that happens to be pro-American. And by 1959, they're successful. So Fidel Castro leads this revolution. But at this point, Fidel Castro is not saying that he's like a Marxist or a communist or anything. He's certainly kind of a leftist. And Che Guevara certainly is. But they're not in cahoots with the Soviet Union at this point. And as the new leader of Cuba, victorious in this revolution, Fidel Castro needs some help. And he wants to go to America to get some help, get some financial resources. We're like the uncle to the north. Not, only 90 miles separates Florida from Cuba. We're really close. Going to get a little help to get themselves on their feet. But the United States doesn't give financial assistance without some strings attached. Like, we want to make sure the money is going towards things we want it to go towards. And we want to make sure, ultimately, American interests are protected. Well, this new nationalist leader of Cuba doesn't want to consent to these demands that the Americans would have. So where else could Cuba go for assistance? That's the Soviet Union. So Castro will do two things. He will go to the Soviet Union to see if they're willing to offer financial assistance. And they will be. And he's also going to move to nationalize Cuban industries. And we talked about the idea of nationalizing industries last uh, meeting with uh, Nasser, right, in Egypt, who tried to nationalize the Suez Canal and was ultimately successful in doing so. It means to take it over for your nation, or, or in Iran, the nationalization of the oil industry in Iran back in, in the 70s. Uh, so to nationalize means to take it over for the country. Well, a lot of American business interests were kind of annoyed about this, right? And a lot of Cubans who were doing well from that relationship are kind of annoyed. And many of them, these are a lot of the people that were successful in Cuba during the pro-American years, they fled. And where do you think they flee to? Florida. So if you look at the Hispanic population in Florida, it's very different from the Hispanic population in Texas and New Mexico and Arizona. It's largely, it's a large minority is Cuban. Many Puerto Ricans, but largely Cuban. And what's kind of interesting is, politically speaking, how do most Hispanics in the United States tend to vote, Republican or Democrat? Largely Democrat, overwhelmingly Democrat, except for Cuban Americans. Those descendants of those people that left Cuba with the Cuban Revolution, they tended to be vehemently anti-communist, right-wing, pro-business kind of people, more naturally aligned with the Republican Party of both the 1950s and today. So a guy like Marco Rubio in, in Florida um, uh, is of Cuban descent, a, a, a grandchild of, of Cuban immigrants, um, and he's an up-and-coming leader of the Republican Party. So the United States, obviously, is not too keen on this new relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want the Soviet Union to have a friend that's 90 miles from us. The one thing that the United States has going for it, both in World War I and World War II and now the Cold War, is the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, right? Thousands of miles of border with, uh, of ocean borders between us and anyone that can do us harm. But now the Soviets are coming 90 miles south of Florida, and this scares us. So almost immediately, upon the relationship with the Soviet Union and Cuba, the United States is going to place an embargo against Cuba. We will not sell them oil. We will not sell them consumer goods that American produ America produces. We will not buy from them. Cuba's livelihood is in their sugar production and in their tobacco production. <coughs> their famous Cuban cigars that I hope none of you ever get into a nasty habit of smoking. 
cigars in general, but Cuban cigars, because not only are you destroying your lungs, but you are supporting the communist dictatorship in Cuba. And it's illegal, you're not supposed to buy it. So we placed an embargo against Cuba. And then we began to actively work to remove Fidel Castro from power. Do you guys recall we talked about Eisenhower's new look? was using, one aspect of that was using the CIA for covert operations to try to topple governments. We tried on a couple occasions to assassinate Fidel Castro. Unsuccessfully, but we tried. But our most audacious move would be in what's going to be known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. The planning for this began under Eisenhower's administration. The idea would be to take a couple thousand young Cuban expatriates, guys that had left Cuba, and say, hey, what do you say if we hooked you up with some pretty sweet weapons, gave you some training, if you aren't necessarily military people, we'll train you up, give you some guns, take you on some boats back to Cuba, and dump you off so you can storm the beaches of Cuba and start a popular uprising against Fidel Castro. What a great plan. What could possibly go right? Now, Eisenhower is going to be done with his presidency in 1961, in January of 61, and the new John Kennedy is going to come into power. Kennedy will receive this plan that's already been in the works from Eisenhower. This is one of the interesting aspects of American presidential politics, is even if there are, like, just because we're switching a president doesn't mean all the crises around the world stop. Everything keeps on ticking. We just have to switch guys. So Eisenhower tells Kennedy about this plan for the Bay of Pigs invasion. Now Kennedy's got the plan. He's got the choice of whether to go through with it or not. And he's concerned. If he goes through with it, it might work. High five, get rid of Castro. Get rid of the Soviets 90 miles south of our border. But what if it doesn't work? Eh, it could be a disaster. It could be really bad. All right, so what if you just don't do it? Well, if you don't do it, what might Republicans accuse you of? Going soft against communism. And now you're a Democrat again, just like Harry Truman was accused of going soft against communism. So he's kind of stuck. And he ultimately goes through with this Bay of Pigs invasion. You can see the Bay of Pigs. I, it, it's actually called the Bay of Pigs. Um, on the southern part of Cuba, right? The American Navy takes these Cuban expatriates to the Bay of Pigs. We drop them off. Our hope is that we can, that they can neutralize the Cuban Air Force and that the United States, uh, or pardon me, as they were landing on the beaches, that Cubans themselves would stand up with them and rise up against uh, the uh, Cuban government and march their way on to Havana and topple Fidel Castro. And it went horribly wrong. The Cuban Air Force was stronger than we ever gave it credit for. <coughs> the popular uprising that the CIA said would happen never happened. Does that sound familiar? Americans thinking, like, if we go in and topple a government, the people would be like, yeah, awesome, thanks, America. Let's, let's work together and do some good things. Didn't work in Iraq, didn't work in Cuba, right? And then finally, the United States was not truly able to offer our own air support to this invasion. We couldn't really use our Air Force and start shooting at the Cubans or start destroying the Cuban Air Force as it was in the air. Why? Then we'd be at war with Cuba, and then could mean war with the Soviet Union. So this was bad. Do you recall, why, why didn't Adolf Hitler ever invade England in Operation Sea Lion? He didn't have air superiority. Why were we able to successfully invade not only Normandy, but really every other island as we island hopped our way across the Pacific? Because we had air superiority. You kind of have to have that if you're going to have an amphibious invasion. And the Cubans had air superiority. We couldn't use our... We certainly would have if we opened the, the, uh, the gates, but we weren't going to do that. So the Bay of Pigs invasion is a disaster. Almost all of the guys that were in an invasion force, about 12 or 1,400 guys, almost all of them would be killed or captured almost immediately. And this was a tremendous humiliation for the United States, a tremendous humiliation for Kennedy's administration. The aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, or pardon me, the Bay of Pigs invasion, a weaker United States, 
And the very thing we wanted to happen, like Castro being out and the end of a Soviet relationship in Cuba, the opposite came true. We pushed Castro and the Soviet Union together. Because now Castro is, like, rightfully concerned. And in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs invasion, Castro will sign a defense agreement with the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union and Cuba will now have a defensive treaty alliance between the two of them. Which leads us to the next part of the story. Now with a defensive alliance between Cuba and the Soviet Union, Fidel Castro will, of course, allow the Soviet Union to bring soldiers and weapons into Cuba. And some of those weapons will be spotted by none other than U-2 high-altitude reconnaissance jets flying over Cuba in October of 1962. So we're in October of 62 here. And this is one photograph that was taken by those U-2 flyovers. And it's hard for us to make out here, but you guys can see that there's like missile transporters and there's uh, missile dollies, all kinds of things that we, we, you would need and things we've seen in the Soviet Union already that would allow m Cubans to have long range, what are known as, what are known as intermediate range ballistic missiles, IRBMs, intermediate range ballistic missiles. Missiles that could be equipped with a nuclear warhead and hit virtually every American city unless you live up in Seattle, Washington, or Portland, Oregon. This freaked us out. Now not only were the Soviet Union's friends with uh, Cuba, but now they were putting missiles in Cuba. And you recall the other day how we talked about the presidential election of 1956, and we said that the Suez crisis that erupted in Egypt was deeply concerning to Eisenhower who had a presidential election in the next few weeks. And what do we call that event, or any event that happens in October? What's that? October surprise. Well, here we go again. It's October of 1962. We're weeks away from congressional elections. And it's an off-year election that the president's not running, but every member of the House of Representatives is, and a third of the Senate is running. And John F. Kennedy, to get his policies through his government during his term, needs a friendly house and he needs a friendly Senate. And how will it look to the voters in November if the Soviet Union is putting nuclear weapons in Cuba 90 miles away from us and they can, they can strike us when you are the president back in 1961 that launched the failed Bay of Pigs invasion that squeezed these two entities further or closer to each other? Not going to look good. And the Republicans will certainly destroy the Democrats over this issue. So here's another, maybe the greatest example of an October surprise in American history. What is known as the Cuban Missile Crisis will take place over the next 13 days. From the day that Eisenhower, or the day that Kennedy is shown these photos, on October 14th, to its ultimate resolution on October 27th. And most of it takes place in the White House with John F. Kennedy speaking to his top advisors. One guy that was there advising the president uh, was the chief of staff of the Air Force, a guy named Curtis LeMay. You remember Curtis LeMay? Curtis LeMay was the guy, the Air Force guy, that wanted to do what? Destroy, Destroy what? Japan. Japan, all of the Japanese cities. Just like, let, let's firebomb them all, right? And he was the guy that, that erased the lines between civilian and soldier in Japan, right? What do you think he's going to advocate in this situation? They, if they've got nukes there, we better strike them first. We better get them first before they get us. Kennedy, Kennedy, calm that down a little bit. Not going to go there. But he's got to do something. Because he can't look weak in the face of this incident. And he can't allow there to be nuclear weapons in Cuba. So what Kennedy will do is he will as he says, quarantine the island of Cuba. It's essentially a blockade, but we can't call it a blockade because a blockade is an act of war. So we're going to call it a quarantine, but it's really a blockade. But you can't call it a blockade because a blockade is an act of war. So we're going to call it a quarantine, but it's really a blockade. All right. Which essentially means we're going to blockade Cuba. We're not going to let anything else get in because we were concerned that they have the missiles there, but that the warheads were on their way. 
all right, that the actual nuclear warheads were making their way to Cuba. Now, one side story. That's what we thought at the time. What are we going to learn when future meetings happen and when, and when archives are open? That nuclear warheads were already on Cuba. We didn't know that at the time, all right? So this is pretty gutsy stuff, kind of, you know, ramping up the guts that even happened during the Berlin Airlift. So Kennedy will launch this quarantine. And the Soviets still have ships making their way to Cuba. One of the tensest moments of the Cuban Missile Crisis will come on October, on October 24th, when a Soviet ship ignored the quarantine and continued to move to try to pass through. And the United States Navy responded by firing shots over the bow of that ship. Purposely not hitting it, but giving it the message that you better turn back. And ultimately they did. But obviously a very tense situation here. The crisis would come to an end on, on October 26th and October 27th. On October 26th, Khrushchev, I can't believe it's legal right now. On October 26th, Khrushchev will send a telegram to John F. Kennedy. Khrushchev will send a telegram to John F. Kennedy. And that telegram offers a deal, a way for both sides to get out of this. Does, does Khrushchev want nuclear war? No. Nope. Does Kennedy want nuclear war? Nope. So it offers an out. Khrushchev says in this telegram on October 26, if you promise to never invade Cuba, do not threaten Castro, we will pull our missiles out. Kind of a quid pro quo there, right? You give a little, we give a little. And as Kennedy and his advisors are thinking about what to do with this, the receipt of this telegram, a second telegram comes. The second telegram takes a much harder line, likely not written by Khrushchev again, possibly from the Communist Party now in, in the Soviet Union, who was not very happy with how Khrushchev was handling this whole situation. The second telegram demands that the United States not only not invade Cuba again, but also that the United States remove our missiles that we have in Turkey. Oh yeah, side story. The United States has ha have had nuclear weapons in Turkey ever since Turkey was admitted into NATO back in the 1950s. And Turkey borders the Soviet Union. So what is Kennedy going to do about this? Well, he does like what many of you guys are going to do in your lives, or you're already doing. He acknowledges the first telegram and pretends he didn't even receive the second one. All right, so you guys are, oh yeah, I never got your text. I didn't see that, okay. I would have responded, but I must not have gone through. Crazy. I mean, all those other ones went through, but that one didn't. So Kennedy will respond to the first one. He makes a calculated move to send the response to the first kind of easier telegram. And the United States will agree. We will not move to oust Castro again, and we never have. And so the Union will agree to remove their missiles. But Kennedy is going to make a secret acknowledgement of the second telegram. Knowing that with the receipt of the second telegram, the Soviets probably wouldn't just accept the, the safety of Castro. So he says on the side, and there's got to be top, top secret. Two conditions. We will remove our missiles from Turkey. There's two conditions. You've got to keep it absolutely silent. This cannot be written about in your newspapers. This cannot pop up anywhere. It's got to be absolutely silent. And it's not going to happen until the new year. Until what has happened? Until the election has passed. Because in the end, if we promise not to oust Castro, and we have to take our missiles out of Turkey... Who's the real winner in the Cuban Missile Crisis? Soviet. Arguably the Soviet Union, because we want to take a step back. Think about pre-missiles in Cuba. 
What was the situation of the Soviet missiles in Cuba before the Soviet missiles were in Cuba? There are no missiles in Cuba, right? What's the position of Castro before there are missiles in Cuba? He's in danger. We're trying to oust him. What's the position of the United States in Turkey? Missiles in Turkey. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, what's the situation of missiles in Cuba? No missiles in Cuba, same as it used to be. What's the position of Castro? Safe. That's an improvement. What's the position of American missiles in Turkey? From the Soviet perspective, missiles are out. That's an improvement for the Soviet Union. So it's almost as if the Soviet Union in this Cuban Missile Crisis got two wins, and all the United States ended up doing was getting back to where we were before the missiles were ever put there. We got nothing out of it. But in the immediate, because this isn't going to be reported on, Kennedy looks like a hero, right? Yay! No nuclear war. That's good. Let's vote for Democrats in 62. Yay! Look what he did. Save the world. All right. And it would only be history later that would tell the, the whole story. The story of President Kennedy is a very interesting one. It's his assassination. He will be assassinated in November of 1963, just a year after all this goes down. History has kind of rethought how, like, or, or Kennedy, the way people thought about Kennedy before his assassination and certainly after his assassination received kind of a change. You know, he wasn't bad a lot. You know, there wasn't a lot of anti Kennedy talk. There certainly would have been in 1964 if he would have lived to run another election. But his assassination really kind of sanitized his record. Um, he was not nearly as popular, um, uh, especially with regard to foreign policy issues, during his administration. Um, and we'll touch on that again during the Vietnam War era. So the Berlin crisis resulting in the Berlin Wall, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest that the Soviets and the Americans would ever get to actual combat nuclear war.